I am pumped this morning. I am so excited about sharing God's Word. And uh, having said that, studying this passage this week, I have been humbled uh, by the depth of truth in God's words. And I've done my best with God's help and prayer to, to just divide the truth rightfully. But I'm not a theologian. And uh, there are people way more knowledgeable about the Bible than I am who have come to different conclusions on this passage. So this morning, if you don't have the same theological view that I have, that's okay. That's okay. I've struggled with these truths for years, gone back and forth myself. But at this point in my Christian walk, I'm absolutely convinced on what I'm going to share with you this morning. So be like a Berean. Right? Go back to the scriptures. Study them yourself to see if what I'm saying is true. So this morning, who are you in Christ? What does the Bible say about the believer's identity? See, your identity is who you are. It's your sense of self. It's your distinguishing character, your personality. And both Christians and non-Christians alike have their identity rooted in all kinds of things. We root our sense of self in our possessions, our success, our jobs, our wealth, our relationships. We root it in our roles, our reputation, the opinion of others, our religious activities, and our sense of control. But the reality is that all of these things are temporary. Our identity should be rooted in the eternal. We're going to learn today that most of the Ephesian believers had a misplaced identity. So in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul teaches us that a believer's identity is to be rooted in Jesus Christ and the truths that distinguish a child of God. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to stand. Open to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read verse 1 uh, excuse me, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. I am so thankful this morning to be able to share your word and what you've shared with me. May our hearts be open. May we have that spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know you better, know your word. These truths are very difficult to understand. They fly in the face of our culture. But God, help us to get it that our security might be in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. May be seated. So Ephesus is one of the largest cities in Asia Minor. In fact, it was estimated that they had up to 100,000 people. It was a trade city on the Aegean Sea, and it was a great place for a missionary spreading the gospel because there was always people coming and going to Ephesus. However, in Acts chapter 19 we learn that Ephesus was a very dark place. It was heaped in idolatry, witchcraft, sorcery. And you get the idea that most of the people in Ephesus, their identity was rooted in this false religion, this religion where they worshipped um, the Greek goddess Artemis. Well, Paul preached the word for two years, and the Bible says that everyone heard that many people turned to Jesus However, their identity was still rooted in the wrong thing. It was rooted in the occult. It wasn't till the third year that God caused this huge revival of repentance. See, seven non-Christian men went to this guy who was demon-possessed, and they tried to drive out the demon. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches, come out of him. Well, the demon looked at the men and he said, I know Jesus and I know about Paul, 
but who are you? And he jumped on the men, pounded them, beat them so bad that the Bible says that they ran out of the house bleeding and naked. Well, when this happened, great fear seized everybody in Ephesus. The name of the Lord Jesus was highly honored and exalted. It says in Acts chapter 19, many believers, not pagans, believers came and they confessed that they had still been practicing these magic arts and they brought their books and they burned all these scrolls publicly and the Bible says that it was equal to 50,000 drachma. That would be worth several million dollars in our time. Well, so we look at that thing. Is it possible for a believer to have their identity rooted in the wrong thing? And the answer is yes. It's very possible. But here's the truth this morning. There is an unshakable security for the believer whose identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. So let's look at it here. Paul's sitting in this Roman prison, right? He's getting ready to... He's getting ready to have his appeal before Caesar. And I can't help but think he's thinking back to the Ephesians identity. He says, I've got to remind them of this. So look at verses 1 through 14. Paul reveals that the believer's identity is found in being a child of God. Look at verse 1. Paul says that he's called by the will of God. He sets the stage here by putting the spotlight on God's sovereignty. Right? That God is a supreme ruler. His foreknowledge transcends all time and space. He exercises supreme authority. And Paul's point is, is that he has a divine, sovereign plan. And the, the, the wonderful thing, though, is, is that even things that are not in his plan, he works out so that they conform to the purpose of his will. Think about all the things in our world that are happening right now that are not in God's plan. All the wickedness. All the evil stuff that Satan is stirring up. Folks, God is big enough to take those atrocities and turn them into working out for his plan. And that should give us a lot of courage, right? Our God is in control. Well, then he calls them saints. And I had to look this word up. I'm like, what is a saint? It's a person of great holiness, virtue, benevolence. And I promise you that he wasn't telling them that they were saints based on their perfect behavior. He was saying, you're a saint based on the fact that you have been chosen by the living God, that his righteousness has been stamped into your life. That's what makes you a saint. So when you look at that, you think, well, wait a second. Why do I have a hard time calling myself a saint? Because I do. It's difficult for me to say, well, I'm a saint. Why do we have a hard time seeing ourselves the way God sees us? Well, I want to give you a little insight into myself. Sometimes I'm afraid I might be too spiritual. You know what I'm saying? To call myself a saint might just be too spiritual. You know, if I identify myself with what God says, I'm going to become proud. I'm going to get puffed up. But it's God's desire to identify ourselves with what he says in the word. And if he calls us a saint, we should call ourselves a saint. That's who we are in him. That's who he says. So then he tells us that we've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And that word in is translated in union with. It's not symbolic. It's a true spiritual oneness. So this morning, if you're born again, this is good news. You are embedded. You are fixed. You are enmeshed with Jesus Christ. You're fully recognized as a true son, a true daughter. And not just in heaven, Paul says, but in the entire spiritual world among its kingdoms. I mean, did you notice that in the scriptures this week? It said, blessed all blessings in the heavenly realms. It's plural. And when Paul says that, 
He's talking about the spiritual world, right? The invisible world around us with angels and demons and the world we can't see. But he says that there's many different places or realms within this spiritual world. Well, we know about two, right? We talk about them all the time. There's the kingdom of heaven, God the Father and his angels and the saints who've gone before us. There's hell, a temporary holding facility until the second judgment, the lake of fire, which is another place. But Paul indicates that there's other kingdoms too. You might say, well, why is this important? Because he mentions it five times in the book of Ephesians. In 1.3, 1, 1.20, 1, 2.6, 3.10, and 6.12. In fact, he says that in 6.12 that these kingdoms, some of them, are at war with God's purposes and his people. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So you have these satanic kingdoms, right? Ruled by their princes, sending out their generals, sending out their uh, colonels, sending out their captains, their lieutenants, to make war on God's people and to stop his purposes. And we see that more clearly in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, where Daniel has prayed because he's seen this vision and he's waiting for the answer from God and the angel that is to bring Daniel the vision is stopped by the, what the Bible calls the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So we see that there's a literal Persia, but there's also a spiritual Persia. There's a battle going on there. Every demonic. And this is what Paul wants us to understand. When he says we're blessed in the spiritual realm, if you are born again, in the spiritual world, you are recognized as a child of God. Let that sink in for a minute. Every demonic ruler, authority, and power recognizes your identity in Christ in the spiritual realm. And these Ephesian believers were at war. You know, it's interesting. I wonder if God kept Paul in Ephesus for three years because he wanted to teach him spiritual warfare. He was in the heart of darkness and he was learning these things as, as God taught him. But we're in a spiritual battle too. And this made me think about my own life. Do you know that many times Satan's lies, his accusations, his attacks are a direct attack against our identity? Have you ever thought about that? You know, you can't be a Christian. Look how you blew it yesterday. You're not good enough. They're direct lies against our identity. So we need to know who we are in Christ. Well, he gives us seven specific blessings that identify a child of God. Look at verse 4. It says you were chosen before the creation of the world. This means before you existed, before you had done anything good, God chose you, and he didn't choose you because of who you would become. There was no personal merit of your own. It was completely outside of yourself. You had nothing to do it. It wasn't even because later on, God knew that you would choose him. He just chose you because it pleased him. If you're born again this morning, this is a miracle. Nothing short of a miracle. And I want you to think about this. Out of an unimaginable number of people, God chose you. See, salvation is all of his work. The only thing we have to do is hear and believe. That's what the scripture says. It's all about him. And Ephesians, the fact is, is that if you, when we read on in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, we're going to find that we couldn't even do that if it wasn't for his grace. Because faith is by grace. It's a gift from God. So Paul says, we are chosen. So this might have you thinking, well, wait a minute. Is Paul implying 
that some are not chosen? Yes. He is implying that. That you have been elected, that you have been chosen. Well, well wait a minute. Does this contradict John 3, 16? Whosoever believes in him, right? Whosoever believes in him. Well, the Bible teaches that everyone is invited to be saved. Jesus says in John 7, 37, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but Jesus says few are chosen. Now, we don't know whom God has sovereignly chose to save, but we do know this, that he has clearly given everyone the opportunity to be saved. See, even to the point, 1 John 2.2 2 says that Jesus not only died for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. That, that blows my mind. He has paid the price for people that will never receive that payment, that will never appropriate it to themselves. What a waste! But yet he loved them enough to do that. So, how do we look at it? Well, as believers, from our vantage point, everyone is chosen. Everyone is potentially chosen. We share the gospel confidently. We pray for the lost with confidence. I mean, 1 Peter 3, 9 tells us we can do this. The Lord is not wishing that any should perish, but that, should reach, but that they should reach repentance. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. God desires everyone to be saved. However, this is, this is the point. God, what God desires, he doesn't always will. So even though he desires everyone to be saved, we know the truth is, is that everyone will not be saved. Spurgeon said it like this. When we get to heaven, there's going to be a big banner. On the front of it, it'll read, whosoever will may come. And you're going to walk up underneath that banner, and the back of it's going to say, chosen before the foundations of the world. See, all are invited, but not all are elected. Well, how can that be? It seemed to contradict. No, these truths don't contradict each other. They're inseparably married together. Here's the principle. If you want to write this down, write this down. All have the opportunity to be saved, but God reserves the right to save whom he chooses. Let me say that again. All have the opportunity to be saved, but God reserves the right to save whom he chooses. Romans 9, 14 uh, through 17 puts it like this. Well, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It, meaning salvation, does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, that's a difficult truth. That's something that'll cause you to wrestle with the scriptures for a while. What is it telling us? What, how, how does that, what, what's, what's that mean for us? Well, it means this. If you were born again, you are secure in Jesus Christ. This is completely out of your hands. He chose you. Jesus even said that. He tells his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. So this morning, rest in this. If you were born again, God has chosen you. Then in verse 5, he says, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as son. Again, the spotlight is on God's sovereignty. He determined it in advance by his pleasure and divine will. See, no one forced, no one forced God to include you in his plans. It delighted him. 
Now, regarding adoption, one commentator wrote this. I thought this was beautiful. When the adoption was complete, it was complete indeed. The person who had been adopted had all the rights of a legitimate son and his new family and completely lost all rights in his old family. In the eyes of the law, he was a new person. So new, so new was he that even all the debts and obligations connected with the previous family were abolished as if they never existed. Wow! So here we are, we're born first into Adam's family, but then second, we're adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. We have all the rights of a true son. All the junk of our past is gone away because that's how God sees us, a true son. A true son, a true daughter. So our sonship, it's authentic. It's genuine. We're engrafted into the true vine. Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And Paul says this all for the glory of his grace. Amen? So verse 7, he says the third blessing. He says we've been redeemed. We have redemption through his blood. Redemption is gaining something in exchange for a payment. We were all condemned to die because of our sin. God's law said the soul who sins shall die. But the law also said that a payment could be made. Something innocent could die in the place of something guilty, someone guilty. So for hundreds of years, you had the Jewish people bringing these lambs and all kinds of these sacrifices to the temple to try to make atonement for their sin. But once a year on the day of atonement, the high priest made atonement for everyone's sins. He went into the holy place, or the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And if you're not familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, let me give you kind of an explanation. The Ark of the Covenant was this, this big box. And on the box, it had a gold lid. And the gold lid had two angels on it, and they were kneeling with their wings pointed towards each other. In the middle was called the mercy seat. And in the mercy seat, that's where God, the Bible says that God would appear, the smoke would appear of God's glory. Well, inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments and his law. So what the priest would do, the priest would take blood of, of a bull for his own sin, and then the blood of a goat for the sins of the people, and he would go in and he would, he would sprinkle a little of the blood in front of the mercy seat, but then he would sprinkle a little bit of blood on the mercy seat. Are you getting this picture? Jesus Christ, our intercessor, our high priest, goes before us into the holy of holies. He goes in and he takes his own blood, his own blood that appeased God's wrath for all time, eternal atonement. He used his own blood, not the blood of goats, not the blood of bulls for the sacrifice. He went into the most holy place and offered this sacrifice once for all to free us forever. See, Jesus didn't go into the earthly temple. Jesus went into the true temple. He went in to the holy of holies. In the presence of God. Where the ark of the covenant is before his throne. And he placed his blood there. On the mercy seat. Why? Because when God looks down at his law. Underneath that, underneath that cover, God doesn't see the laws you broke. God sees the blood of Jesus Christ in your place. The innocent died for the guilty. That's why John said, look, the Lamb of God. That's exactly who he is. And his blood has made atonement forever for you. That's good news this morning. I want to see that. One of these days when I go to heaven, I want to walk into the temple and I want to look on that cover and I want to see Jesus' blood. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Spurgeon said, Jesus doesn't redeem us by his sinless life or his moral example, but only by his death in our place. His blood. Observe, it's not redemption through his power. It is through his blood. It's not redemption through his love. It is through his blood. So let me ask you this morning. Have you been redeemed 
by Jesus' blood? Have you turned from your sin and put your faith in him as your payment? Because if you haven't, today is the day to do that. He paid the price for your sin. Well, verses 9 and 10 said, he made known to us the mystery of his will. And this is the first of the three mysteries that we're going to learn in Ephesians. God the Father will ultimately rule all things. And how's he going to do that? He's going to resolve it through Jesus Christ, his son. He's going to put everything under Jesus Christ. And then 1 Corinthians says this, then the end will come. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. You remember all those kingdoms we talked about? Jesus Christ will destroy them. And he is going to bring everything under him, and then he is going to submit everything to God the Father so that God the Father will be all in all. What? A wonderful time that will be. In verse, uh, verses 11 and 12, we see the fifth thing Paul says we're blessed in heaven. He said, in him, we were also made heirs. Again, you were predestined to inherit God's kingdom. You are a beneficiary of heaven. Paul tells us if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. In, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. And this is all for his glory. You know our salvation is for the purpose of Jesus Christ's glory? For the purpose of his glory. We are his sons and daughters because we are his inheritance. God's ultimate plan was to bring his son great glory through a kingdom. And we are that kingdom. Verse 13 tells us then that we were included in Christ. You're now part of God's people. And this made me think, the Jewish people are still God's chosen people. Israel is still his nation. Because God will never break his promises to Abraham. Genesis 12, 2 through 3 says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. See, God has a special love for the Jewish people. We should love them too and support them. And this is what Paul's saying. As a Gentile, you're now receiving all the blessings of the Jewish people through the gospel. All the promises and the blessings God made to Abraham now apply to you. <laughs> That's great news. When you read the Old Testament and you see all the promises God's made, every single one of them now apply to you too through the gospel. Peter says it like this. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Well, the last blessing today that Paul mentions, he says you're marked with the Holy Spirit guaranteeing your inheritance. You see, the moment someone repents and puts their faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is given to them. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's the third person of the Trinity. He's not in it. He's the spirit of sonship. He's Jesus' own spirit. That's why Paul says, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. And the spirit is the one who marks and seals the believers. The seals, how does he do that? Well, he guarantees our authenticity, right? Because a seal in that time guaranteed that it was authentic. He indicated ownership, right? If something belonged to somebody, oftentimes they would seal it. A seal was something that indicated we were approved or that, that something was approved and we are approved. It was protection and warning. And then Paul says the Holy Spirit not only seals it, but he's a deposit. He's a pledge. He's a down payment for us guaranteeing 
our salvation. And there's a principle here that I want you to catch. If you're born again this morning, you can have absolute, complete confidence and assurance that your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. If you're born again this morning, you can have absolute, complete confidence and assurance that your salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. So rest, children of God. Stop trying to earn the Father's approval because you already have it. Right? We work, so, we work so hard sometimes to try to earn favor, but we already have favor. God chose you. His sovereign plan and purpose in election is permanent. Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So do you find yourself walking on spiritual eggshells sometimes? I do. You're confident in your salvation as long as you're doing good works. But the minute you're not living up to your own expectations or you blow it, you immediately stop doubting your salvation, or you start doubting your salvation. Yeah, I'll raise my hand. I think many of us could identify with that. It's very normal for people have a who have a desire to please God with all their heart to do this, but stop. It's not God's will. There is such security for the believer it's not one minute we are in Jesus Christ and the next minute we're out of him. This, is, this was good news for me personally because I'm a type A perfectionist guy. If I don't get it right, then, you know, I'm the bad person. But it's not like that in the scriptures. It's so beyond us. Jesus Christ has chosen you. You are secure in him. And he says, I give them eternal life. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My last division, I'm going to run through very quickly here. In verses 15 through 23, Paul prays for the believers. He says, this reason when I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints... You know, Paul identifies two most important characteristics of a true Christian. He says faith and love. These were the reasons for his continual thanks to God. So what is biblical faith? Two words, trustful obedience. That's what biblical faith is. Believing God and acting on that belief. It's not just believing in God or having this intellectual understanding of him. That kind of faith doesn't please God. James 2.17 says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. Real faith confidently trusts what God says and obeys it. This is what he meant when he said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You know, Abraham, here he is. He was promised that he would become this great nation, that God would make his name great, and then God tells him to take his one and only heir to a mountain and sacrifice him. Instead of God, instead of Abraham arguing with God about what God asked him to do, he just obeyed and went. And the Bible says, or the book of James says, this was credited to him as righteousness. He was obedient in his faith. Then Paul says that it's love for all the saints. He emphasizes love. You know, Christians are supposed to love everyone, but the greatest love should be for believers. Amen? Yeah. We're called to love all, but our greatest love should be for other believers. This is what Galatians 10 says. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And then Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, love one another just as I have loved you. The newness of the commandment was the fact that now he was setting a new example. He was saying, I'm getting ready to lay down my life for you. Now go out 
and lay down your life for each other. That's the love that God calls us to. Well, then in verse 17 through 23, Paul tells them two specific things he's praying for. He says, I pray that you have a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you know God better. And he wasn't asking them, to, he wasn't asking God to give them another spirit. He was just saying, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, opens your, your heart to understand these deep truths. See, God, de God desires everyone to know him deeply through his word. And this is what we talked about last week, that it's challenging. Because you have, to, you have to think about it. It's not something that you can read just like a textbook and get it. You have to meditate on it. You have to spend some time in it to get to know those deeper things. But when a believer does commit to doing that, the Holy Spirit does enlighten us. He acts like our instructor and, instructor and gives us that wisdom. Knowing God deeper certainly creates maturity in the believer. Then he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart are enlightened. Down to the core of us. God wants us to know these spiritual truths. Finally, he says this is all for the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. We touched on this a little bit. But it just blows my mind that out of everything Jesus owns, Visible and invisible, you are his most treasured possession. You are his inheritance. The love that he has for you is so intense, so deep, so thorough. He looks at you and says, you are my treasure. Isn't that good news this morning? 